Hello everybody and welcome to my clinic. Today we're going to check out one of the most successful Italian films of the last two decades, Perfect Strangers. Here in this clinic, we try to understand what causes poor writing, we try to prevent it, and we try to make it better. Patients can show severe medical conditions or just symptoms like today's patient. Perfect Strangers was indeed a commercial and critical success. It also won the best movie at the Italian Davide Donatello's, and by all means, it's a good movie. By Italian standards, it's even a great one. But the story has its flaws and it's causing the movie to fall short from its potential to be one of the best Italian movies of all time. Today we'll understand what makes this movie so good and we'll also understand what's preventing it from being the masterpiece that it could be. Let's check out my first Italian patient, Perfect Strangers. Let's start out with pointing out what makes the movie great. Its strength lies in its concept. The tried and true formula for a suspenseful film, a dinner party gone wrong. Perfect Strangers presents it to us with a latter day and ingenious variation on the theme. Seven friends gather for dinner, but the agent of their distress is their mobile phone. For the course of the evening, they agree to read aloud or broadcast every text message, phone call, and email they receive. Most of the characters have grown up together and know each other extremely well, supposedly. Perfect Strangers plays on this near-universal fear via party game, in which dinner guests share all incoming messages and calls in a recipe for awkward revelations. It doesn't matter if characters are immature or the plot lacks depth at certain moments. The concept grips the audience because mostly everyone with an active cell phone life has used mobile phones in ways not meant for public consumption. The premise cleverly expands on a fear few even consider contemplating, being found out. La quanto dura? Lele, la quanto dura? Oh, mi dici la quanto dura? Once, secrets were shared between friends. Now, the mobile phone has become the repository of our illicit behaviors. And the moment that's exposed, all is laid bare, with no protection. One might say this is a once-in-a-generation high concept. A stat that supports this claim is the fact that it holds the Guinness World Record as the most remade film in cinema history, with a total of 18 versions of the film. The title, the plot, and also the tagline, everybody has three lives, a public, a private, and a secret life, all evolve around the one single fear we all have, that of our secrets being made public. And the cell phone is the only thing keeping those secrets from being discovered and ruining our lives. Lele, guarda che non è nessuno. Lele, uno di Facebook è una cazzata. Oh, mi guardi, ti dico che è una cazzata e questo nemmeno non lo conosco. Hai uno che neanche conosci, ti chiede se ti sei messo alle mutande. From such a powerful idea, the film had the potential to be an all-time great, and it has great sequences. Like when dramatic irony keeps the audience on their toes during the cell phone switch between Lil and Peppe. But it falls short from reaching its full potential. Let's check out the first symptom of poor writing. When thinking about a film, one must never underestimate the power of the screenplay. A great idea very rarely is enough to make a great movie. This story revolves around seven friends, Rocco, his wife Eva, Cosimo, Bianca, Lele, Carlotta, and Peppe. And one may argue there's no protagonist, and that all seven of them are main characters. But unless the film is called Potionkin Battleship, it does have a protagonist. And it's not necessarily who we root for, but they are who has the major transformational arc and the most change from beginning to end of the story. 
At first, it may seem we are following the arc of Cosimo, because he is the first character who is seen as the movie starts. Cosimo is actually supposed to be the villain, but more on that later. But we are soon drawn to think that Rocco is instead the main character. He is the one who is the most morally defendable and because of this, the audience feels empathetic towards him right from the start, when he defends his daughter when discussing with his wife. The fact that Rocco is the protagonist is confirmed at the end of the movie when he voices the premise and the moral of the story. Hai ragione tu. Questa è diventata la nostra scatola nera, dentro ci abbiamo messo tutto. Forse troppo. Ed è sbagliato giocarci. But this bit of dialogue feels forced when watching the movie. Rocco tells the moral of the movie, but as a character, he did not learn it through the story itself and his personal journey. Nothing happened for him to reach that kind of awareness. It feels forced because it doesn't feel natural. It seems like the author of the movie is speaking through the mouth of Rocco. And even if what we see does not actually happen, we as an audience need to see and feel a proper transformational arc to understand the character's words and believe them. Rocco falls short as a main character because he has not given this proper character arc. First off, his motivation and desire within the story aren't clear. At a certain point, he expresses to his wife his deep desire to save their marriage, reason for which he started going to therapy. But this want of his isn't acted upon. He does not follow through with it. He does not act accordingly to his desire. There is no action or intention of his that move him towards the achievement of his wish. He just mentions it and kind of disappears then. The more the movie moves forward, the more he becomes a passive observer of the tragic downfall of his group of friends. Come se non fosse mai successo. L'unica cosa che ci ha tenuto insieme è stato il senso di colpa, il mio, quello che tu mi hai fatto provare tutti questi anni. Not to mention that his secret pales in comparison to the ones of his friends. One is hiding their sexuality and their gender. The other ones are hiding numerous affairs with friends among them and also with people outside of their group. The fact that Rocco is hiding from his wife that he bought condoms for his daughter is insignificant compared to the stuff that goes down with the others and is in no way a plausible reason for their marriage to go wrong. That's why this conversation. Ma perché non glielo dici tu, mamma? Ma cosa? La verità. Ma sei matto? E invece ci devi parlare, è una vita che te lo dico. Uffa papà, lo sai com'è? Con me si incazza solo, non mi ascolta mai. Ma perché devi saperla prendere? Ci vuole un po' di pazienza. Sì, ce ne vuole tanta di pazienza, eh. E eh, vabbè, ce ne vuole tanta. Però insomma, secondo me ne vale la pena. Just isn't enough action by Rocco. It's just not a strong enough beat for his character to develop properly. He needs more. Without any kind of action from his part to reach his goal, Rocco's transformational arc does not happen. Therefore, there is no change in him and the dialogue in which he tells the moral of the story feels forced and out of context. There are no beats that justify him learning the lesson. And if he already knew the lesson from the start, then what is the point in what we saw? What is the point in the story? There is no change. And if there's no hint of difference of outcome, whether he played the game or not, everything just feels insignificant. But what if he was given a proper arc? That means he at least acted in order to obtain his object of desire, which is to save his marriage. And him saving his marriage would be represented by the rekindling of his relationship with his wife, Eva. And what stands in the way between Rocco and his wife? Obviously, his dear friend Cosimo. Because of this, Cosimo becomes the villain of Rocco's story. But Rocco does not know that Cosimo is the one who is standing in the way between him and his goal. If he somehow suspected one of his friends was the obstacle to his desire, the dinner would be his battlefield, in which his want would become finding out who of them is keeping him from his wife. Prove Eva he is the better option by defeating this person, in his mind, this would win her over again and it would rekindle their love and fix the marriage. 
Rocco would start by trying to figure out who is the obstacle. And once he finds it in Cosimo, their silent battle over Eva would accompany us as we see the skeletons in the closets of each one of them come to life and destroy their relationships. Adesso sì perché. Ma perché forse è vero che l'analisi non serve a niente, ma voglio tentarle tutte. Se ci sfasciamo almeno non avremo il rimpianto di non averci provato, no? In the actual story, everything crumbles on Cosimo, but he self-destructs, not because Rocco pushed him into a corner or managed things to go that way. Cosimo doesn't get away with his unfaithfulness, and all of his secrets crumble upon him because the plot leads the story to that point. Plot makes him self-destruct because Rocco doesn't do it. This leaves Rocco with two equal outcomes by the end of the film. In the what-if scenario, there's a sad reconciliation with his wife, and in the real life, they get ready to go to bed together. In both cases, he keeps his marriage alive, but in both of them, it's still plagued with lies and deception. If Rocco had a subtle fight with Cosimo and won, he would have brought him to destruction, ended his fling with his wife, and he would believe that this would bring him back with his wife. He would have also caused the end of the relationship between Cosimo and Bianca. Lele, Pepe and Carlotta would have been caught in this spiral of secrets, hate and unloyalty and everyone would have lost everything. Rocco's antagonist would be totally defeated but he would have soon realized that the tragedy in front of his eyes would have not meant that he won Eva back nor that their marriage is saved. He would have lost everything and would have understood that the failure of his marriage wasn't caused from a fling his wife had with a friend of his, but in something far deeper. Why did you have to do the game? Why did you like it? No, you're just in point. Do you have something to hide? No. Then why? Because we are frangible. This way, playing the game would have brought him to an ironic ending. It would have made him lose his goal, but obtain what he needed, a true understanding of what caused his loved one to distance herself from him and his marriage to fail. On the other side, them not playing the game would have had the opposite ironic ending. His unfaithful wife would have stayed physically close to him and his friendships would have not ended. This would have given him what he wanted, the opportunity to stay close to his wife and try to rekindle his marriage on the long run, but would have prevented him from obtaining the deeper understanding that he truly needed. This second ironic ending is the ending that the movie opts for, but without a concrete transformational arc driven by the main character and his desires in the hypothetical scenario in which they play the game, the story gives an unsatisfying ending. And what we are left with is a non-resolution where the main character neither obtained his desire nor what he truly needs. Everything is the same as the beginning and in both the reality and the what if situation, he is given the same outcome. As a consequence, there's no feeling of purpose in what we have watched, and we are left with the sensation that something is missing. Because of this, no character development happens in the major beats of the film, which leads me to the second main issue of the story. If we divide the story of perfect strangers using Aristotle's poetics and the three-act structure, we can easily deconstruct the main beats of the story. Let's consider the top part of this graphic, the positive story values, and the bottom part, the negative values of the story. Story values are the universal qualities of human experience that may shift from positive to negative or negative to positive from one moment to the next. A scene usually requires a shift from one value to another in order to give the story a sense of movement. 
If a scene lacks a value shift, it will fall flat, and some scenes have more than one value shift. A scene is an action through conflict in more or less continuous time and space that turns the value charged condition of a character's life on at least one value with a degree of perceptible significance. Ideally, every scene is a story event. With this graphic, it's easier to spot the main story events and how they affect the value charge from positive to negative or from negative to positive. In the first 10 minute setup, we are introduced to the main characters and we can see, especially with some of them, that something is going on. The inciting incident is when they all meet for the dinner. Then we have a debate phase where the characters discuss on whether or not they should play this game. When the game is first considered, the value changes to negative. The characters worry that this may lead to something which they will then regret. The first plot point is when they actually start playing. They enter this parallel what-if world and everything seems to go well initially. This changes the charge to positive. Plans are prepared and executed, and alliances are formed. The midpoint is the scene where they're on the balcony and decide to take a selfie all together. From this point on, the value charge changes to negative more and more until everything is totally lost and their relationships completely destroyed. Betrayals are found out, skeletons come out of the closets, and the true feelings of some of them are discovered. Their marriages are destroyed, and their lifelong friendships come to a tragic end. After this, we witness a turnaround, and the value turns to positive, but it's ironic. It's positive on the surface because their relationships go back to an order, but we know that what they are living is a lie, and that their ghosts and their lies will come to haunt them in the future. It's just a matter of time. But this ending leaves us with a sense of bitterness. We feel there's something not right. Something is missing in this third act. E basta, mamma mia, sempre così. Amore, ti sbrighi che fa freddo. Arrivo, arrivo. Major screenwriters and authors say that when the third act isn't working, the problem isn't in the third act, it's in the first one. And if we analyze this structure and its major beats while taking in consideration what we said on the main character and his arc, we can understand that the problem is indeed in the first act of the story. Observing all the major beat and how they affect the story and its charge values, we can immediately see that the inciting incident when they all meet at Rocco Neva's place for the dinner doesn't truly change the charge values of the story. It's not something that triggers our characters to action or drives the main character's life out of balance. The inciting incident is supposed to be the moment where the protagonist's life is upset, forcing them to make a choice. It should create a dramatic question and provoke the question, how will this turn out in the audience's mind? It could be anything from a war breaking out to a boy agreeing to go out on a date, but it should be huge in a protagonist's life and world, and strongly connected to the genre and the story. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen in Perfect Strangers. Them meeting for dinner does not trigger what an inciting incident should give life to. It doesn't upset our main character's life, and it does not create a dramatic question in the audience's mind. The rest of the movie, and especially the third act, are negatively affected by this missing piece. The other beats suffer from the main character not being forced to make a choice and do not offer enough value change to motivate Rocco's character development. As a result, the rest of the story events happen to everyone without affecting anyone in particular, therefore not allowing the presence of the main character's arc we talked about before. Carlotta! Mamma mia, oh, e su! Sono dieci anni che siamo insieme e te abbiamo due figli bellissimi. Dovresti conoscermi. Ma forse non abbastanza bene. By not being driven into action, Rocco doesn't have a particular goal or something to fight for, or a layer of conflict within the whole plotline, thus unfortunately becoming in the second half a passive observer. 
If instead Rocco was giving a proper inciting incident that would have driven him into action, something linked to his desire to save his marriage with Eva, we would have had a more active and interesting protagonist and we would have witnessed his attempt to save his marriage during that dinner, thus having beats that allow his character to develop. His choice to play the game would have had a deeper meaning and as a result, more tension. He would have made that choice conscious it could have saved or completely destroyed his marriage. At the end of the film, Rocco asks his wife this question. Unaware that those earrings are a gift from Cosimo. This element was first given to us when she aggressively returns them to Cosimo, after she finds out that he is betraying not only his current girlfriend, but her as well. The problem is how and when this story element is delivered. It doesn't lead anywhere and therefore it's not utilized for character development. What if Rocco asked about those earrings at the beginning of the film? What if his suspicion regarding a pair of earrings he never saw before was the inciting incident? It would have driven him to act in order to find out who gifted them to her, suspect it's one of their friends, discover with who of them his wife is going to bed with, try to prove he is the better one by defeating Eva's lover as an attempt to save his marriage, only to have his own obsession fire back at him when the secrets of all of them are exposed, ruining each relationship, lose his wife and realize that the problem runs deeper than just unfaithfulness. This would have given the main character a chance to develop a proper arc and leave the viewers with a catharsis at the end of the film when they discover that nothing truly happened. Feeling a bitter sense of relief knowing that the protagonist didn't actually lose his dear wife, but is still living in a marriage plagued with lies and deception. This is only an example of what could have been done to allow this great story idea to reach its full potential. Never underestimate the power of the screenplay. Però la cosa importante l'ho imparata. Cosa? Saper disinnescare. Cioè? Non trasformare ogni discussione in una lotta di supremazia. Non credo che sia debole chi, chi è disposto a cedere. This is my first Italian patient. It's a good movie, a really good movie and a good story, but it could have been a great one, maybe even a masterpiece. That's why you need a good story doctor. If you enjoyed this video and wish to support my humble clinic, subscribe, drop a like and leave a comment letting us know what you think about this movie. That's all. Hope to see you soon.